Texas A&M University. As uh, you can see, he is the Robert Kennedy Endowed Professor. Um, and uh, more importantly for me, he was my PhD supervisor at Texas A&M <laughs> University. <laughs> and he has great influence in me and also in another student. Uh, I mean, his, one of the other students is the advisor of Dr. Sergeant Lukic, who is also in the uh, Freedom Center. So he has oh. influences in others. And the greatest advice I had from him, and which I try to follow, is uh, as a faculty, uh, the best thing we do and the most important responsibility of ours is to train and shape young minds so that they become successful contributors to the society and, and productive and be themselves successful in life. So that's why what, what we try to teach to the students. So, Professor Asani obtained his uh, bachelor's and master's from UT Austin and then did his PhD from University of Wisconsin in Madison. And uh, he spent uh, his working life in Oregon National Labs and then he joined Texas A&M University in, in, in 1982. 81. 81. <laughs> <laughs> and he has been a st uh, the stimulating factor in developing several programs at the Texas A&M University programs in um, electric hybrid vehicles and power electronics, like motor drives. He keeps moving from one to other, and lately he's more into sustainable energy, and that's what he is going to talk about today. So, uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> you might want to keep the applause till you see the presentation. You may want to take it back. <laughs> Thank you very much, Iqbal, for that kind pres uh, introduction. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. It gives me no, no uh, nothing can give me more pleasure than being invited by ex-students who are successful leaders themselves to, 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 uh, to do these things. Uh, uh, I have actually with me a PhD candidate right now who is the student of the student of my student. Uh, and so maybe that shows you how old I am, but I like to think of it as loyalty and uh, having passed on something. Uh, this presentation is uh, a little bit of information, but really not too much about information. Information is easy to get, and you can all access it uh, much more efficiently than I can. Uh, so I'm going to use the time mostly for maybe perspective and, and interpretation of information. And, uh, The, uh, I don't promise this to be uh, uh, pleasant or reassuring of what you already know uh, and, and no verification that we all agree. So, uh, you know, for, for, for your money, this is going to be, you know, controversial. I guess the light is okay, right? Good. The earth is rotating. Sometimes it doesn't rotate, but today it's rotating. Uh, uh, the, the fundamental... Uh, if you stand way back, actually, this planet is covered with a very thin film, like algae almost, uh, a living organism to which we are, uh, of which we are a part of. You know? and, and this uh, living organism, which actually has created the atmosphere that we are in, is highly interdependent. And life creates life. Life supports life. We don't fully understand these interconnections. And uh, we have to be both uh, kind of respectful, almost a sacred uh, uh, trust of ours to, to, to do right with this, and also to be humble enough to learn from it and not uh, create, a, I see a lot of familiar faces. What are you doing here? <laughs> uh, a lot of our students have run away and come to this program. <laughs> Don't you get any ideas? <laughs> I see some of my own students in the crowd here. <laughs> uh, but uh, to actually get inspiration from it and not to create ecosystems that are intellectually kind of like a marginal line, you know, <laughs> that, that is supposed to hold back the, the disaster, but usually it's uh, poorly conceived. Uh, here are some, uh, some ideas that, uh, again, facts, facts that you, you would know as well as I do. Uh, the surface needed to, to support one human being uh, is about 2.3 hectares per person. What is a hectare? About seven acres or something like that. Uh, and, uh, and in various countries, uh, uh, people consume uh, uh, the resources that require 3.2 uh, hectares in Italy, the, uh, the, the one of the most uh, resource efficient uh, uh, nations. Uh, and in the U.S., we need nine hectares per person to support the type of lifestyle we have for, for extracting natural resources and absorbing our, our, uh, our garbage and, and resources. 
And the planet, on the average, based on pr uh, current uh, population, can supply 1.9 hectares per person. So on this, uh, again, these numbers are thought uh, provocative. I'm not even sure if on what basis they are. I've copied it from different places. But it certainly gives the idea that in some ways we are already exceeding the capacity of this planet to give us resources and absorb our, our, our rejects, if you will. Uh, now, now, this, you know, the, it's a very interesting thing. I added this last entry uh, just before I, I left. We don't feel any of these shortages and crisis in this country. That's because we are a very prosperous uh, society. The type of stuff that is damaging the planet does not really affect us, except maybe intellectually and maybe morally. It really affects the poorest people in the world. Uh, it creates uh, poverty, uh, millions of, uh, of uh, economic refugees, many of the things that appear to be political uh, or cruelty or whatever, dictatorships, they're really politically motivated uh, problems. And so it's the poorest strata of society in the world that, gets suff that suffer because of these shortages. Uh, uh, and uh, that happens to be about 90 or uh, you know 90 percent of the world population. At least the bottom 10 percent or 20 percent is the one that really gets gets the uh, brunt of it. Uh, the most interesting thing about this slide probably is the fact that by some calculations, only 500 million people in the world can live by American standards. And 300 million of them are already here. So our way of living, this wonderful room and, and the type of uh, breakfast I was served and everything else, can only be had by, uh, and the type of cars we drive and everything, by 500 million people. It, it w w so we are really at the very tip of a very steep pyramid in terms of consumption and standard living. It gives us a sense of perspective. It's impossible for the Chinese to live like Americans. Physically impossible. The planet isn't big enough. Uh, and so the question is, what do you do? How do you, uh, and so we have to go to this old miracle of engineering to actually have a cake and eat it too. And in this case, have the cake also expand as you're eating it. How can you create quality uh, for everyone in a sustainable way? You know, how do you do that? Well, uh, uh, one of the main uh, uh, thought contributions I hope to make today is to, is, to, is to show you, first you have to think in the right way. You have to solve the right problem. And uh, you have to give up trendy way of thinking uh, and, uh, and elements of faith and go to elements of fact. Uh, here are some numbers that are really ast astounding to me. Uh, again, it comes from the sources I have. I can't vouch for them. But it gives you a kind of a, a heads up type of a thing. Uh, some of the fundamental materials we need for modern society, phosphorus, which is the main element of fertilizer that fixes nitrogen into the plant, which is necessary for photosynthesis. We have about 142 years of it left. Copper, 40 years. Without copper, there's no electrical engineering. There's no employment. Uh, zinc, for preventing steel from, from rusting, which is steel is the, you know, one of the foundations of modern society after Stone Age. Uh, 20 years, hefmium, indium, some of these uh, things that uh, my, my uh, respected uh, colleague uh, Jay would know more about. Apparently, I don't know, is, do these numbers uh, make sense uh, in such short supply? I don't think that those numbers make sense. Uh, that's the thing, you know, most of us. They're certainly used in the chips. Yeah, exactly. They are they're the essential ingredients of, 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 of uh, integrated circuitry and, and solid state uh, electronics. And uh, you know, nobody's looking up to see what type of world resources we have in this. Now, I understand all these numbers are very soft. Technology and new exploration can discover things, but these are the type of numbers we are seeing today. Uh, uh, tantalum, another one of those, uh, is this a rare earth? Uh, or anyway, it's one of those elements we don't uh, use daily, but are used in, in solid state devices. Uh, platinum as a catalyst, look at that. Uh, silver and so on. Uranium, 40 years or so. I, I, by the way, I, I, I do welcome emotional reactions and, and provocative questions. I, uh, I, I, uh, as my, I have another professor from which I got my inspiration, and he always said, 
I'm often wrong, but seldom in doubt. And, and that also defines the way I talk. Uh, if you think about it, the way we teach engineering is from the point of view of the materials are infinite and indefinite. You always have enough of it. So now just um, basically optimize your design for the performance. It's a very narrow-minded way of doing engineering. It's not holistic. It doesn't take into account uh, the, the entire life cycle, where it comes from, where it returns to, how much of it is there, uh, and will it fit into the big picture in its design life cycle. Uh, and it appears that, uh, of course, energy demand is rising. We're going to talk about that a lot. That's really the thrust of this presentation. But it appears that the supplies are shrinking. We're going to re-examine all these premises. I'm going to tell you all the things that, that seem to be right. And then, hopefully, I, we will re-examine it closely. And I'll give you my perspective. Uh, I've been working on sustainability for 10 years. I've uh, been working on energy for 45 years. And the closer I look, the more agnostic I become. Almost all the assumptions that, that motivated me in close examination tend to be, uh, seem to be uh, not so right, maybe wrong. Or maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, so energy shortage, global warming. Two well-known motivations for sustainable energy and sustainable lifestyle. Who can argue with that? Of course, we know about uh, 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 greenhouse gases and, and, and uh, the cl uh, uh, climate uh, warming. It's the entrapment of the radiated heat uh, from, from the sun. It's supposed to, to, most of it is supposed to reflect back, but it's re rising, raising the surface temperature because of the gases we put in the atmosphere, apparently. And in fact, uh, uh, data completely supports the fact that uh, since the dawn of industrial age, the temperature of the planet has been rising. And these numbers, for those of you who have studied them, appear to be small, but they're extremely important numbers because it has to do with uh, polar ice cap melting, uh, ozone holes, and whatever. Uh, but then you stand back, and you get, look at these uh, uh, temperature cycles of the planet on a 400,000-year basis, and it appears that the temperature has been abruptly rising and then falling. And uh, in fact, the CO2 and the temperature are always correlated. But the funny thing is, if you look at it, CO2 is the black one. The temperature rise appears to be always a little bit preceding the CO2 rise. Now, I'm not trying to be a conservative Texas oilman here. I don't have enough money to, to be that. Uh, but what I'm saying is, uh, number one, these trends have been going on. We know these from scientific facts. I take that for facts because, you know, for, from ice core drillings and, and tree rings and so on and so forth. Uh, these cycles exist, and in fact, they seem to correlate with the sunspots and so on and so forth. The temperature is rising. The CO2 is rising with it concurrently. But concurrence and causality are two different things. And there are enough people that doubt that. That doesn't mean it's true. That doesn't mean it's false. I take the position of, I don't know. I don't understand these people's science. What's the scale of this uh, Minus 400,000 years. No, I meant the vertical scale. Oh, the vertical <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I borrowed this from someplace. But, but uh, this is a recent time. So whatever the current, uh, I guess this kind of gives it a little perspective. Uh, this rise on this scale correlates with this area over here. I'm sorry, I, I, can't, uh, I can't give you. Well, th this is the last ice age. So this is on the much smaller scale than the other. That's what I was thinking. In terms of uh, vertical scale? Yeah. Larger. larger scale. This is a larger scale. Larger scale, yeah. And this was a different perspective. Yeah, this, uh, the, the 200 years, which is almost invisible here, is just that little one of these ripples. So these things happen. So you're right. So what does that say? Does that say that uh, uh, what I said was not right or right? But, but I, I'm trying to kind of, we can discuss the details in the, at, at the level of the grass, but I'm trying to rise above it and see, can we make some tenets and, and, and verities that motivate us to do sustainability that is not dependent on whether this assumption is right or wrong? 
please do ask questions, but also bear with me. Uh, I want to give you a kind of a bigger perspective. Uh, one of the things I want to suggest to you is that uh, 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 the uh, CO2 uh, reduction is not a reliable motivation for doing uh, uh, sustainable energy. It's not reliable. It's a mantra. It sounds reasonable. I'm not convinced. I would not base a national, international policy on this belief. And by the way, the world isn't doing it either. You know, when they get together and have these conferences and set standards, uh, the major uh, uh, powers like U.S. and a few others don't participate, and the rest cheat. And they all say, well, you know, we'll do it as soon as the U.S. joins. So uh, in reality, it doesn't happen. Here's another thing that I think is far, as far as I can tell, more reliable argument, and that is oil is a, is a fungible commodities, a commodity. That means if you don't use it, somebody else will. So if I make a very efficient uh, uh, power plant or automobile, and I actually use zero oil for energy, where do you think that oil is going to go? We're 2% of the world population. The other 98, and say the, uh, Europe is another 2%, that's 4%. 5% of the developed nations decide to be really ethical about the CO2 emissions. That oil is going to be consumed by the rest of humanity, China, uh, India, Africa, Latin America. These people are still coming up to 21st century uh, standard of living. So it will be consumed. Fundamentally, the cheapest, most accessible energy will be used for human development. So if, it's not like if we don't use it, CO2s will go down. We have to think about this. To me, this is a fundamental thing. Uh, because of this uh, vast population of the world, that has to come up to, to standards. When you think uh, ecology, you have to think universally. You can't think nationally. Uh, now, oil and hydrocarbon fuels and fossil fuels, of course, are uh, essential for you know, basically the, fo uh, the foundation of modern society. Road transport, which happens to be my area of specialization and interest, uh, but also fit, uh, 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 chemical feedstocks, plastics and synthetics, industrial production, agricultural fertilizers, ter terribly important if you want to think about uh, 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 biofuels from plants, corn ethanol takes a lot of uh, fertilization, petroleum-based, as well as mechanized agriculture, uh, electricity generation, most of it still from natural gas and, and uh, coal, uh, heating and cooling and air conditioning, uh, city planning, the whole concept of suburbs is created by the, uh, because you have automobiles. You can go to town to shop and come back to the suburbs and have a big yard, not live in a uh, you know, high-rise apartment in Istanbul or, or, or uh, Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, if you look at the trends, the only thing interesting about this graph is that, in fact, uh, let's look at this, which is closer to the present. Most of the oil is, in fact, used in transportation. So transportation is the toughest problem to get off of oil, if, in fact, it was good to get off of oil. And there are fundamental reasons for that, and we'll talk about that. Uh, here is a, com a composition of current world uh, consumption of energy, most of it for combustion, uh, natural gas, uh, <coughs> oil is about a third, coal is about, tw uh, about 22%. Uh, this is natural wood and dung and so on and so forth used in a traditional way. Nuclear is fairly small. Hydro, fully exploited mostly, but it's just limited in resource. And renewables, which are coming online, is kind of beginning to make a penetration. Okay, here's one of the numbers that are, I think, terribly important to know. Uh, the world, the Earth, as far as we know, has 500 exajoules of hydrocarbons. Exa is 10 to the 18th, I believe. Uh, the current world consumption is 0.5 exajoules. So on this two basis, we have a thousand years of hydrocarbons on this planet. 
Shortage? What shortage? We're not going to be uh, getting out of Stone Age because we run out of stones, as somebody said. We're going to have to have another motivation. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in my mind, I think that, uh, you know, we've learned to even domesticate fish. The seafood that we eat is no longer really pr uh, predominantly harvested from the wild in the oceans. We actually domestic we have our own fish, uh, catfish, you name it, we, tilapia, <laughs> we can do it. But as far as energy is concerned, we're still in the kind of the Stone Age. We're cavemen, the way they used to gather their food. We go out there and, 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 and gather wild energy. We're hunter-gatherers. Of course, we have a nice name for it. We call it exploration and production and all these things. But hunter-gatherer, you know, rather than cultivated or manufactured energy, like we do anything else. Of course, we have to depend on the planet. Uh, before I got started with this, about 10 years ago, uh, I, I have these tendencies to kind of uh, create my own world model and then, and then compare it to other people's world model. And, and, and the process is very educational, usually both ways. Uh, I asked myself, what do I consider sustainable energy? What should be the attributes? And I wrote things that are far uh, more extensive than other people have written down. And I, I present this to you, and at the end of the presentation, maybe you will see that some of these things do, do make sense. What should be a sustainable energy attribute? It should be abundant. What I mean by abundant, I don't mean cheap and, and, and wastefully available. I mean, it shouldn't be the primary uh, stop or, or obstacle to human development economically and, 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 uh, and so on. Clearly, it should be ecological, which hopefully means renewable, but environmentally it should be acceptable. If greenhouse gas is, uh, is an issue, then it shouldn't do it. Uh, although I, I don't particularly consider that a good motive. <clears throat> it should be economical, which means uh, it should start from the current infrastructure and transition to where you want to, oh, well, uh, no, that's the next one, actually. It means that it has to be, it has to work in a market, in a, in a free market type of an environment. It cannot be imposed by a nation, a government, or a, a international agreement. These things don't work. Nobody's smart enough to create a discipline for everybody to follow. It has to be discovered, it has to evolve, it has to be organic. It has to be, this word does not exist in the dictionary, it's a pity. Uh, I couldn't find any word to replace it with transitional. That means you have to be able to get from here to there. If you have a great idea, technology, system of sustainability for energy or anything else, but you have to totally uh, neglect the current infrastructure and the practice and, and start a whole new society with a new way of doing things. This disconnect means it's a non-starter. You have to be able to get from here to there. You have to use the current infrastructure to kind of evolve you or give you a launch to the future. So it has to be physically transitionable. It has to be economically transitionable. The other thing is it should be global. There is no such thing as a great sustainable energy solution for the United States. If that was successful, you solved 2% of the problem. It's a world problem. It's a human problem. In fact, as you'll see, there are a lot of paradoxes that go along with these things. If developed nations truly become energy independent, and they just cut themselves off from international issues, become isolationists, and become rich, wealthy, healthy, self-sufficient uh, elite, well, that's the, uh, that's the recipe for the next world war, the haves and have-nots, the 5% versus the 98%. So it has to, you have to, as, as you prosper, you have to make sure that if you mow your lawn, you want to make sure that the, your neighbor is also mowing his lawn. Otherwise, it's not that attractive. And our neighbors happen to be all around the world. Uh, public acceptance. Democracy requires uh, basically acceptance by, by the society. So things that are perceived as undesirable, unattractive, high risk, simply won't fly. Doesn't matter how logical they are. They have to be publicly acceptable. Unifying. It has to be compatible with the world, a sense of world justice. You know, proliferation. Nuclear power is a desirable thing, let's say. But you can't have it because you're untrustworthy, and you can't have it because you're a terrorist. It's not unifying. That's not a good solution. That's not a unific solution. So we have to be, it has to be something kind of like the Marshall Plan. It works for me, and it works for me more if I give it to you. That's kind of like the way Star Wars worked, you know, with a strategic, 
uh, we invented it, and we told the Russians, or the, uh, at that time the Soviet, and we want to give it to you. We want to make also our own uh, uh, weapons obsolete. Of course, it was a bluff, but the idea was a very good one. They got so panicky, they went them democratic. <laughs> they gave up their dictatorship. Because what kind of a solution is this that works for both sides of the enemy uh, line? Uh, these are the type of solutions you want to suggest. It has to be robust, which means no single point failures. A pipeline of high value hydrocarbon fuel can be blown up or can, can, can be disabled with a small rupture. Uh, so these single point failures, you can do, the, the, do it for the space station and launching astronauts to space because you have no choice. But for something that life depends on, on this planet, single point failures are terribly dangerous ways to go. So you would rather have a distributed power generation, uh, energy production, and distributed usage, not concentrated. Which brings us to the last point, it has to be secure. It should not be vulnerable to uh, terrorism uh, or any kind of act. So basically, you don't want to prevent a terrorist. You don't want to kill all the terrorists. It can't be done. But you can make them obsolete. You can make them impotent. You can basically put them out of business. So let me talk briefly about an integrated, uh, these are ideas that I developed about 10 years ago and I was fortunate enough to attract some of my colleagues at Texas A&M who are really technically competent uh, to work with me and, and actually put the elements of the technology together. An integrated, let's say we, we want to get, out of, get off of fossil fuel type of consumption, specifically for transportation, uh, for a variety of good reasons. Maybe greenhouse gases and, and, uh, and, and climate warming is real. Uh, but more importantly, uh, to get off of the hunter-gatherer mode into, into a cultivated energy, closed cycle, uh, energy-neutral, uh, carbon-neutral, fully controllable, not seasonal, not political uh, type of a infrastructure that combines fuel and, and transportation. How do you do that? Uh, There are a few things that uh, you may or may not know or may not believe, and, and, and uh, I believe that uh, liquid hydrocarbon fuels are essential for transportation. It's fundamental. Uh, and the reason for that is that half of the fuel, which is oxygen, is already out there, and, and you don't have to carry it on board. Uh, and, and liquids uh, are easy to, uh, to charge or to transfer, both uh, in the distribution system and to the vehicle. They form themselves to the shape of the container, so they are very efficient in tanking. Uh, they're not volatile and so on and so forth. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, here are some numbers that, that are true, but there's a fundamental fact behind them. I, I drive a diesel car uh, uh, for reasons other than ecology, actually, because I, you know, it gives you a long distance between two Phillips, which is more important to me as a user than, than the efficiency, but I take the efficiency as well. Uh, but uh, if you look at the diesel fuel, it, uh, its density, energy density per gallon, 129,000 BTUs. Now you compare that to uh, a number like uh, lithium ion battery, about 6,000, that's a factor of 20. Is that because of our technology of batteries? Now, if you actually, I, we published a paper about 12 years ago. I thought I was going to get a national honor for that paper. It wasn't even reviewed. Uh, uh, it was barely published. That I showed that uh, uh, the covalence ba uh, bands, or the energy of, uh, that is released when carbon and oxygen are combined versus the best elements that you can put in a battery, the energy density of these two is not anywhere comparable. And in fact, uh, half, of the uh, half of the fuel, which is oxygen, you don't have to carry on board, but in a battery, you have to carry the fuel and the oxidant. So you're carrying two, two, two times the, the mass. And then you have to have the environment for this thing to recombine in a reversible way, the hardware that goes with it, the density of it, and then the density of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the power plant, an electric motor versus the internal combustion engine. There's no comparison. The electric motor has a fundamental limit saturation of iron near two Tesla. 
that gives you a, min a maximum amount of torque density that you can get in a machine and power density that you can get in, uh, for a given uh, investment in, in weight and volume. And so this is pretty fundamental that the hydrocarbon fuel, liquid fuel, plus internal combustion engine, in terms of energy and power density, is fundamentally superior to a chemical battery and electric motor. Now, don't despair. I'm not here to talk a Texas conservative line and run out. First, we have to get the illusions out of the way before we can work on realistic problems that make sense. There are good problems to work on in the subject of today's discussion, but these are not the ones. Hydrogen economy, some of you are old enough to know that white elephant. Uh, uh, but a hydrogen plus fuel cell plus electric motor is also not compatible, mainly because of the hydrogen. This last part of it is not so bad. Uh, and the reasons are given here, uh, but I've pretty much talked about it. Uh, <clears throat> now, if we can produce bio, liquid biofuel, oh, let me say one other thing. Again, going back to this, uh, uh, this biofilm on the planet Earth, which is highly interdependent, nothing on this planet, there's no biological organism that moves without uh, liquid hydrocarbon fuel. We are liquid hydrocarbon driven internal combustion engines in our muscles. And that's half of the fuel we take in with every breath. Where were electric vehicles first used? On the moon. The moon rover. Why? Because there was no oxygen there. So you had to carry your oxygen and, uh, and your, and your, uh, and your uh, fuel with you and had limited range, very effective. So to think about moon rovers on this planet and ignore the, the presence of carbon and the presence of oxygen is inventing a new ecology. Uh, intellectually, it sounds very impressive, but it's also a little bit arrogant. We have to look to see what integrates with the infrastructure of this planet properly. So it seems to me that if you stick with liquid hydrocarbon fuels, if you, uh, if you stick with internal combustion engine of some kind, uh, and then make your liquid hydrocarbon fuel maybe biofuel, then you can have all the elements that you need. And uh, again, I, I'm not poo-pooing electric vehicles. They have their place uh, on the moon, on Mars, and yeah, not even on Earth. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I've already disillusioned half of the graduate students working on projects here, haven't I? No. <laughs> uh, no, they have their niche, and they will, uh, in fact, uh, uh, occupy that niche. The nice thing is, you know, these promoters of different technologies are helping some sort of a macroscopic evolution. These things are part of a mosaic of solutions. There's no one civil bullet that will solve all the problems. But believe me, electric vehicles are not going to be the dominant vehicle for us or for anybody, except for a few countries whose length is less than one charge. Uh, uh, so, but have electric vehicles, as you will see, I think are fundamentally uh, uh, the next step for vehicles. Now, what's wrong with biofuels? <laughs> they seem to compete with food resources. That's, that's one of the issues on, in this country and around the world. It impacts the price of food. In fact, the price of food commodities is now set by the energy value of those things. To fill up a 25-gallon uh, uh, automobile tank with ethanol takes enough grain to feed a man for a year. So really radical numbers. Uh, I think that this is, uh, I pulled this out of my own head uh, from what I see. I think 60% of co corn in this country is used for ethanol now. Uh, and it's a very political solution to the problem. It's not a technological, even economical solution. And uh, I've had the opportunity to talk to some corn ethanol people, they are extremely both aggressive and defensive at the same time. And, and, and if you give a talk like this, they'll pull you to the side and really give you a little bit of uh, their mind about it. So they're, they're <coughs> it's, it's kind of like believe it or else type of a thing. <coughs> Rather than uh, does it make sense at, at any level. Uh, uh, for example, it takes two thirds of a gallon of oil to produce a gallon of ethanol. Uh, so these are the issues that come up with, uh, with uh, biofuels. Uh, and the other thing is, he, here's a perspective that I carry in my head. We're surface organisms on this planet. 
ideally we can be sustainable if we use uh, surf surface energy resources. That means the, the energy that comes from the sun daily. On the average, we should use no more than a day's worth of energy arrival on this planet uh, 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 for, for a day's worth of uh, usage. Because otherwise, we have to go to stored resources, which is hydrocarbon fuels, which are yesterday's uh, uh, sun that has been trapped in Earth. And that inherently is limited to a thousand years, but it's limited. Uh, and also, I, you know, releasing all that hydrocarbon uh, or, or CO2 to the atmosphere will probably have some sort of an effect. Uh, of course, doing it over a thousand years, we don't know what that effect is. But, but this planet did not used to be uh, inhabitable uh, 500 million years ago or something like that. Uh, it used to be CO2 dominated. Dinosaurs had a great time with it, but, but mammals were pretty uh, unrespected. So let's, let's look at this vision of a uh, sun-driven transportation system where the sun through photosynthesis produces the biomass which is converted to biofuel which is efficiently used and the CO2 returns to the atmosphere only to be recaptured and make a closed cycle. Is this possible? Uh, that's the first question. Uh, clearly, it meets many of the standards that I set for ourselves about sustainability, because this kind of thing done right could be done all over the world, because the sun, thankfully, is very uh, 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 democratic and equitable. So let's look at uh, the biomass. Again, this is something borrowed from my colleagues. Uh, biomass is abundantly available everywhere from trees and grass and agricultural residues and, and so in some places it makes sense to have energy crops. Uh, in India it makes sense. In, in, in clearly in, in, in uh, Brazil it makes sense. You know, sugarcane doesn't make sense in many places, but in Brazil it makes plenty of sense. Uh, the funny thing, the paradox is uh, Brazil can produce uh, uh, ethanol from sugarcane at a lower cost than equivalent gasoline and they got on it and then discovered vast reserves of oil offshore. So now even for them it doesn't make sense. This paradox is just you have to be careful about reality. It kind of catches up with your mind. Uh, uh, municipal waste and, uh, and uh, a tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, animal manure for, for meat eaters. Uh, again, these are a quick uh, glance. Uh, there is enough of this stuff in this, uh, uh, in this country. 135 uh, billion gallons per year to meet our demands for transportation fuel. Now, problem is not solved. The, the resource is there. The resource is distributed. Wow, that's good because that means uh, no single point failure. No terrorist can, can rupture one pipeline and the whole thing will be gone. Even the shipping, international oil shipping lanes. The, uh, Passage of Hormuz, current uh, one little 30 mile uh, passage. Most of it is shallow, so it's probably about six to 11, six to 11 miles that is navigable. 40% of world oil goes through that. And a few people with a few speed boats and a well written uh, <coughs> will <laughs> uh, can disrupt it. Uh, th th it can happen to this. So that part of it is good. It's distributed resource as long as we have distributed processing. Uh, here's another one which I found, uh, those of you who are from India probably are familiar with this uh, Jethropa, uh, Jethropa uh, plant. Uh, when I was traveling through India, I saw it all over the place. Uh, these things grow in places where food doesn't grow well. It's poisonous, so animals don't attack it and eat it. In fact, it's used for hedge around agriculture to keep rabbits and deer or whatever it is that, uh, that attacks the agriculture away from plants. It produces an oily seed which can produce uh, uh, very easily diesel fuel. Uh, again, these are the type of stuff that, uh, that are practical and are being utilized. And uh, in fact, uh, let's see, where is Jetrofa here? Uh, Jetrofa can be produced almost in parity or a little bit cheaper than diesel fuel from, uh, from oil. Uh, so these are things that are, ha have a leg in reality. And again, uh, chemical engineers uh, can work on this, and they are working on this in our group. Uh, to give you a reference point, uh, and this is, this is if you get your biomass from, 
from plants and specific uh, specialized plants, plants that whose specialty is just to grow as big as possible because you're going to use the entire stock, uh, the cellulose basically, to create sugars that create a, a mixture of alcohols of equivalent energy density as gasoline. Uh, then such a such a pl uh, plantation of 15 mile radius, which can be easily shipped to the center, can can produce the equivalent of a medium-sized refinery worth of liquid uh, 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 vehicle fuel. It gives you kind of a perspective. This is not terribly good, but it gives you a perspective. This is not the best way to do it. The best way to do it is to use the, the stock of the corn, but not the seeds, uh, and use the biomass. And of course, uh, the one that is most uh, near and dear to our hearts, uh, hybrid electric technology which is the way of the future, it is penetrating, and I think it's going to become a mainstay because fundamentally you can make hybrid electric vehicles to be better automobiles. Uh, they, are, uh, they, they are the fundamental concept of dual power plants, in this case electric motor and an internal combustion engine, but it could be other combinations. Uh, uh, <coughs> it opens the highly electrified automobile, which it, when it penetrates the drivetrain, opens up all the innovations in electronics and power electronics. Most of you are intimately involved with that. Uh, it can innovate uh, vehicle design because things do not have to be mechanically lined up or otherwise you're going to use heavy gears and so on. So you can actually have flexibility in design. Uh, 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 advanced safety features. Uh, you know, there's a concept that I actually wrote in a, in a white paper. Uh, I thought that the, the, the way to make automobiles safe is not by making them massive and bigger so that uh, when they collide, th they can transfer momentum to the target and keep their own momentum and that way keep you safe. But to make smart vehicles, which use something I called collision avoidance, make it so smart that it will, and it's so, so agile that it, uh, it, 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 uh, it prevents collisions. And I thought our inspiration is, is aircraft. Aircraft are not built to survive crashes, but they are highly intelligent uh, and they, uh, they avoid crashes. And that's actually being implemented in many ways uh, uh, today. But uh, th that integrate, that intelligent, smart car integrates well with high electrified uh, car and so on and so forth. I'm probably burning up time faster than I should. So this concept of a, uh, of a closed loop, uh, sustainable uh, fuel transportation thing technologically is possible technologically is possible. In fact, we're working on several of these technologies ourselves. Uh, here is a, an, a, a rotary engine that one of my colleagues has been de devoting 10 years of his life to. It's a funny thing because the, it's, uh, it's actually, it works on a Rankine cycle, which, uh, uh, which has got a theoretical efficiency of about 75%, okay, uh, <coughs> versus the auto cycle that has a theoretical efficiency of 30%. So it's already double because the combustion happens in a linear, uh, combustor and not uh, inside the chamber. And these are fast moving but non-touching members. I can't talk about that because there's a shortage of time. You can hybridize this engine. Again, this is not the solution. It's an example of things that fit the framework of the, uh, of the solution that I've set up for myself, allowing for all my uncertainties and doubts and disbeliefs. Uh, hybridization of this uh, vehicle is very desirable in both series parallel and series parallel. I won't have time to talk about our series parallel, which has a, an invention called transmotor. It's a motor whose stator and rotor both rotate. Uh, but it does away with the planetary gear and lots of these clutches. Again, only an electrical engineer would think of this. Mechanical engineers think like this when they hybridize. Lots of gears and let's put more gears and clutches in there. We are slowly weaning automotive industry from mechanical engineering into a more balanced perspective with more electrical engineering. Here's a very interesting concept, uh, integration of electric motor with the engine. Integration, I don't mean close proximity. I'm using the same material that you use for strength of materials in the engine forces for flux conduction. Dual, using two properties of the same material and that way reducing mass and volume. Uh, this happens to be a switch reluctance motor integrated with this uh, star engine. Uh, we have half a dozen patents on that one. Uh, you brushes DC motor. Here's, an <laughs> here's actually an embodiment of 
of, uh, of uh, this uh, concept. <coughs> These are the stator windings, and, uh, and, and the rotor is actually a blade that passes through it. Uh, so this is the, your motor, electric motor, integrated with the star rotor engine. So you come up with a can like this, no bigger than this, very high speed, and enough power for a full-size vehicle. Uh, here's a, another technology that I'm working on. I need to get past this because I want to give you the part that is probably the best part of the talk today. I thought of it a week before I came here. I'm going to try it on you. If, uh, if it works, I'm going to keep it. Uh, but the, the, I'm also working on a cold plasma reactor, which is an onboard reformer, non-thermal, which is, can, can be turned on instantaneously to, to convert hydrocarbon fuel to hydrogen, gasoline, natural gas, uh, whatever. Uh, and you could do two things with that hydrogen. Either you can burn it in the engine, you can burn it in a fuel cell, or you can enrich the hydrocarbon fuel with it, which means le using less than 10% of the fuel to convert to hydrogen instantaneously in a, in a device that is the size of a shoebox. In my calculations, for less than $3,000 in mass production. And that hydrogen-enriched hydrocarbon fuel can significantly improve the efficiency of the internal combustion engine. And here's a prototype, in fact, uh, another colleague of mine is, uh, is working on. Uh, and so we are actually putting different gases in there and, and doing some tests on that. But uh, here's what this talk is all about. That was the introduction. Uh, as you know, efficiency has been considered the fifth fuel after coal, petroleum, nuclear, and renewables. And it's a free fuel because you don't actually it doesn't have any, have any infrastructures. You just make things efficient. Uh, but economists have, sh uh, uh, have shown that if you improve the efficiency of consumption of fuel, the use of fuel goes up. It's called Jevons' paradox. It was discovered by another smart Englishman. One of them discovered the laws of thermodynamics so that people stop trying to pump water uphill and try to get energy from it. And this one is called, here's his quote uh, in 1865, it is wholly a confusion of ideas to suppose that the economical use of a fuel is equivalent to a diminished consumption. The very contrary is true. You make things, you make your cars more efficient, people will consume more fuel than before they were efficient. Why? Very simple. If you re increase the efficiency of consumption of fuel, you have effectively reduced the cost of fuel, the cost of fuel per mile. If you reduce the cost of fuel per mile, what are we going to do? Drive more miles. Now you look at yourself and say, I don't do that, I'm an ethical person. We're talking about that uh, imaginary man, which is the entire human beings. What about your teenage daughter? What about your neighbor? What about the Chinese? You see, the consumption goes up as the efficiency uh, goes up. Uh, that is if, in fact, the, the, the cost of fuel is fixed. If the cost of fuel is fixed, but the efficiency goes up, the effective cost goes down, the consumption goes up. It's been true for ages. It's been true in this country. I passed over it. It's been true in England. Every time you improve the efficiency of air conditioning, air conditioning uh, uh, energy consumption goes up. Increase the fuel efficiency of automobiles in this country since 1975, the, car, the, the what is it called, the CAFE uh, 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 regulations. The fuel consumption has gone, we, we drive bigger cars, more powerful cars, and there are 50 million more cars in this country than their driver's licenses. <laughs> Why? Because of efficiency, partially. Uh, those are in that example, but here's a, uh, Here's the, uh, the, the final uh, thing that I did for you. Uh, in this country, approximately, and you may you know, disagree with the specific numbers, but the trend is definitely something to think about. In this country, we consume about 20 million barrels of oil per day. Approximately half of it, or 10 million bar barrels, is imported. And you know all the you know, hoopla about, we're sending $400 billion of money out, this, that, that, that all can be discussed. It's much better to be an importer of raw materials and the exporter of value-added materials. People overlook this, uh, but, but notwithstanding. You know, it's better to consume oil and sell insurance and send movie uh, uh, 
Hollywood movie, mo movies uh, abroad than the other way around. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, the 70 percent of oil is consumed for transportation. That's about 14 million barrels a day. If you do the, uh, calc uh, do the arithmetic, and I did it wrong, this should be 29 percent. Basically, uh, the entire oil imports can be wiped out if we improve the fuel consumption of vehicles by 71 percent. Uh, that means that a car, a bad car, like a Jeep Wrangler, I just got rid of one, uh, that gets uh, 20 miles per gallon with a high wind, would have to go to 69 miles per gallon. Or a good car, 30 miles per gallon, has to go to 103 miles per gallon. Can that be done? Absolutely. We can do it today. We can have full-size automobiles that give 100 miles per gallon. Good ones. I'll give you one example. Chevrolet Volt does that. And we can make nice hybrid electric vehicles can, that can do that. There's no time for me to talk about why hybrids can so easily accomplish that. So this is a possible technology. But what have we done? Well, we have to look at Jevons' paradox. If, in fact, you, you reduce the, <coughs> the fuel consumption of your vehicle to one-third, effectively, you have made your fuel cheaper by one-third. The consumption is going to actually go back, get even, and go further. When you have safety vehicles and airbags in your car, you tend to drive more carelessly. It's a natural human tendency. Inviolable, proven over time. It's like second law of thermodynamics. Cannot be proven, but has never been violated. <laughs> uh, so in order to make the efficiency matter, you have to bring up the cost of the fuel to parity. So if the efficiency has gone up by two-thirds, the cost better go up by two-thirds so that the consumer is not motivated to consume more of it. What does that mean? That means the price of uh, gasoline has to go to $12 per gallon. The price of oil has to go to $344 per barrel. If we do that, if that happens, we have the technology to make automobiles that make it cost uh, transparent to the driver. But until this happens, you better be careful what you wish, <laughs> because if you get fuel efficiencies that are as good as I said, with these numbers not being there, we're going to have more oil imports. Thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. I forgot my conclusions. <laughs> uh, it is possible to develop sustainable vehicle and, and, uh, and, and fuel technology complex. Uh, it can be based on biofuels. All these things are doable. We can do it in this country, and we can export it to the rest of the world without losing anything. We can help the Africans and the Indians and the, uh, and the, uh, and the Asians to actually have sustainable biofuel infrastructure. Uh, it can be uh, carbon neutral. It can be produced everywhere. Uh, however, sustainability must be defined on a more rational base, uh, basis, on a more holistic basis. Uh, the type of reasons, fuel shortage and uh, global warming, just don't do it if you look deeply. And it won't happen when things are not rationally uh, uh, designed. Uh, shortage won't do it. Uh, here are some numbers that you can check. Uh, they're approximately correct. Uh, well, obviously, we have over 300 uh, years of coal in this country. We have over 120 years of natural gas. And we have over 300 years of unconventional oil in North America. What is our fight? We're not going to use Canadian oil because the pipeline is going to kill things. But do you think it's going to stop us if we really don't have fuel? We'll do it. We'll do it. So there's no energy shortage in this country and also around the world. Uh, <clears throat> here are the type of uh, motivations that I have discovered are probably more, more sustainable motivations for sustainability. Uh, world equitable, uh, equitable world energy access, making everyone have sufficient energy for human development. Uh, peace, world peace. Tensions, military and otherwise, that are imposed on nations because of this uh, 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 fuel supplies being in one place, the users being somewhere else, and the third uh, countries being left without uh, population explosion and human development and critical materials shortages. I think these are probably more sustainable reasons for sustainability than some of the stuff that we hear that is part of our 
education. Thank you very much. This time for Sayers. <laughs>